Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Mayer, and I run a small game studio uh, in Shanghai, China, uh, called Ren Games. We're about 10 people. Now, um, back in 2009, I was working um, for a company, and we were playing a lot of this flash game called Crush the Castle. And we thought it was a lot of fun on the desktop. And we thought, maybe we should kind of make a, a clone of this game, because this will work really well on iPhone. And we'll put some better graphics on there and, and, and design it for the iPhone. And um, probably quite a few of you know the name of the game. Um, no, it was not, in fact, Angry Birds that we made. Um, it was called Crash the Crib. Now... Probably everyone in this room has heard of Angry Birds, and probably nobody in this room has heard of Crash the Crib. Um, so why was our game such a failure, and why was Angry Birds such a huge success? Uh, we both had the same game, gameplay mechanics, we both had fun graphics, we had a cool theme with like Hollywood superstars being destroyed by, by um, paparazzi being thrown at them. So... It was around that time that um, when Steve Jobs stood up on stage for the first time and presented to the world the iPhone, he said that we're going to use the best pointing device in the world. We're going to use a pointing device that we are all born with. And in fact, we're all born with ten of them. We're going to use our fingers. And therefore, designing your controls to make the best use of these fingers is really what makes or breaks your game. So, showing you the two control systems of Angry Birds versus Crush the Crib shows some key reasons why they did well and we didn't do so well. So, Angry Birds, as you know, has the slingshot, which is actually a masterpiece of control design. We used a catapult, which you had to just tap one time to start the catapult moving and tap a second time when you wanted to release your projectile. And so we got thinking about why was the Angry Birds one so much more fun for people to use? Why did they get into the game more? And we came up with kind of four key factors that you need to think about when designing your control schemes. And here they are. I'll, I'll go through these one by one. So this is what makes a great control scheme for your touchscreen-based game. So first of all, um, you want your control scheme to be intuitive. Um, now, that's very easy to say. Yeah, you think, yeah, my, my game should be intuitive. Um, what, what we really mean when we say something is intuitive is, is it discoverable? Does the user naturally discover the controls when they start playing the game? What do they naturally do um, in this situation? Uh, we make a, a, a pretty popular game called Pig Rush. It's a kind of infinite running game, so the pig just runs across the screen from left to right. And I've probably watched a thousand people pick up this game and start playing it. And as the pig approaches this first kind of gap, which he has to jump over, people naturally start doing things. They, they hit the screen. They start swiping on the pig madly to try and, and do something. So you need to work with those natural urges that people have to interact with your game. Build your control systems around actions that people naturally do in your game. The second thing that's really important is direct manipulation. So that means um, you are really directly interacting with the game objects using your fingers. You're not using um, sliders or buttons or like power bars to show um, how, how to move the game objects. You're really doing stuff to the objects themselves. Why do that? Because the user feels much more connected to the action. It's less abstract and more like they're really, um, really playing and interacting. And the third critical thing is feedback. Now, going back to the Angry Birds example, when you pull the screenshot, uh, sorry, pull the slingshot in Angry Birds, you get both visual and audio feedback. You see the stretching of the slingshot, and you also hear a noise, a sort of noise as you pull back. And that, again, makes the controls seem much more alive. The user actually sees that their action is having an effect. Um, people felt much more disconnected from 
the control system we have with just the taps. It didn't really feel like they were actually influencing something. And the fourth important thing is for controls to be adjustable. Let me go in a little diversion to explain what I mean by that. So, it goes back to saying we're all humans and what are humans good at? Now, we all have smartphones, but at heart we're still quite dumb cavemen. And we're quite bad at doing certain actions, certain tasks. Humans are very bad at exact timing, at exactly being able to hit a certain point and exact positioning. And that's made worse by touchscreens because often you're not touching quite where you think you are. On the other hand, humans are very good at trial and improvement. If they're slightly off on the first attempt, they will improve their second attempt and get closer. And although we're quite bad at exactly pinpointing something, we're good at motions which are flowing and more inexact. So you can take advantage of these human elements in your control scheme. And an adjustable control scheme works well if you can modify your input as that input is taking place. So a good example of that would be Fruit Ninja, a game we all know well. And in Fruit Ninja, the key gesture is a slice. You drag your finger across the screen. And they didn't just choose a slice because slicing is fun. They chose a slice because slicing is adjustable. Because of the feedback that um, the sword blade shows on the screen, um, you can easily see as you're swiping, maybe I swiped a little bit too low or a little bit too high, and curve your finger and adjust that motion while you're doing it. Same in Angry Birds. You have a chance to adjust before you release the slingshot. In our game, you tap once, you tap once, that was it. There was no chance to adjust your action. You had to start all over again. So, that's all theory. Um, is slicing genuinely more accurate than, say, just tapping? We made an experiment in our office to, to test this. Um, we made a, a pretty awesome game called Square Ninja. You can see we spent a lot of money on the graphics. Um, and we got some test users, we split them into two groups... And we told the first group of people to tap on the red squares. And we told the second group of people to swipe on the red squares. And you'll see the, the little kind of blue line providing a little bit of visual feedback. And in the time limit we gave them, the users who were tapping had an average score of 32. Whereas the users who were swiping, yes, they had an average score of 41. The colorblind users didn't do very well, though. So, um, let's talk about buttons now. So, if you grew up playing games in arcades, you're probably familiar with this kind of button, um, which you'd find on the kind of cabinet of an arcade game. And these are, these are awesome. These are fun. I just want to like reach out and start bashing these buttons as hard as I can. But, of course, when you port this over to a touchscreen, you end up with something like this. You end up with the infamous virtual buttons or virtual joysticks. And you can take a game which is an awesome game on a console, like here, Grand Theft Auto, and apply like virtual controls to it and completely ruin the game. And I think the reason um, why virtual buttons and D-pads are bad becomes very obvious when you go back to thinking about the different factors that go into making a good cons control scheme. They're not really that intuitive. Um, you have to put these um, you know, little icons on, on the buttons, which you then often have to explain. There's also no, no direct manipulation, or not actually controlling the player character directly. And particularly, as you're simply touching a glass screen, there's no real feedback. You can't feel when you're on the edges of the buttons. It's quite common for people using a virtual joystick for their thumb just to slip off the side of the screen and they don't realise that that's happening and then they don't understand why the game is not responsive anymore. So if virtual D-pads and buttons are bad, what are the gestures, what are the actions that work really well on touch screens? Well, there are lots of good examples. Um, there's the pull and release gesture. 
We talked about in Angry Birds, also used, for example, in um, Tofu, The Trials of Chi. Um, tilting can work well, because a lot of games, um, such as um, you've got Tilt to Live there on the left and Labyrinth 2, that can work well on a tablet, on, on, a, on a phone. Slicing type games, so this is Fruit Ninja there and Slice It. And Swipes and Flicks, so Mirror's Edge, probably a rip-off of our game Pig Rush. Um, and Paper Toss. So, you've come up with some ideas for control schemes, but how do you decide if it's actually really good or not? So, to make great controls, you need to test them and you need to experiment. So, an example of the experimentation we did, um, our newest game is called Flockwork. It's an iPad game. And I'll just play you a very short video clip. Hopefully that works. So you see, you've got to get all of these sheep over to the targets and the sheep move together as a flock. And you'll see there with the, the finger, um, the finger movement moves all the sheep at the same time. That's quite a simple concept for, for the controls. I'll move my finger and all the sheep move. But it turns out getting that right and getting that feeling comfortable for players was very difficult. And we had to do a lot of experimenting on that. For example, as I move my finger, does that directly affect the position of the sheep? Or maybe it just applies an acceleration onto the sheep? How much physics do we need to model? Do we need to add friction? So if I send the sheep off in one direction, do they slow down? So there's a lot of things to think about like that. Also, different screen sizes. We designed this originally for iPad, but as of yesterday, now there are two iPads. One is a different size. Does that mean the finger movement I have on a smaller size iPad should be now translated differently? And the way we found out whether we were doing this right was to get people who never played the game before and hand it to them and watch their reactions. And user testing it is super important, but what, what are you supposed to be looking for while you are testing with new users? There are some danger signs that you, you should be looking out for. Look out for people who are trying to do actions which aren't part of your control scheme. So we, we found that in flock work, it's very easy for the sheep to kind of get separated from each other, and people would start pinching on the screen to try and move them back closer together. That wasn't actually part of the control scheme. It was a sign that um, maybe we weren't working with the player's natural actions. Also, sometimes people would lose control of the characters. That people described that it was like the sheep was skating on ice and they would just slide out of where, where you were, wanted them to go. Also, if you start feeling the need to add a tutorial at the beginning of your game to explain the controls, that's almost certainly a sign that your control scheme has already got too compli complicated. A good intuitive con control scheme really shouldn't need a tutorial. So, summing this up, how do I make my game feel good on a touch screen? Think about the four factors. Is it intuitive? Does it have direct manipulation? Does it provide feedback to the user? And is it adjustable? Remember that you're designing for touch, and that's quite different to designing for other platforms, different gestures to think about. And finally, experiment and experiment and experiment, and look for those danger signs. Because remember that testing your controls is maybe one of the easiest and cheapest ways to make your game better. If you went to your visual designer and said, I want to have all of the game assets, I want you to make two or three versions of all of them, and we'll test all of them out and see which one works better. That will take a long, long time and be a lot of effort. But often, going from a bad control scheme to a good control scheme can be you know, quite a, a few small tweaks, and you can easily try out three or four different control schemes. So that's all I have for today. Um, I'd love to chat to other indie developers and other developers at the conference here and share experiences with... Uh, what has worked and what hasn't worked for you in your games. So thanks very much.